So you're walking about in the boondocks of Canada or somewhere else in northern North America and you're getting a bit peckish. And you realize, hey, I didn't store any food for the winter. What's a guy to do? Well, fortunately, you're not up the creek just yet. Let's take a few lessons from the First Nations and look at some of the plants that could be foraged once winter is upon us. First off, fruit picking. Now this may seem like an odd time of year to be going picking fruit, but if you walk around the woods at this time, you'll actually see that a number of different types of trees and shrubs will still have fruit on their branches. And for some of them, that's just because there's, you know, some drier fruits from the summer that didn't get eaten, but for some of them too, it's just that the fruit really isn't a preferred food source by any of the animals here. And highbush cranberries here are a great example of that. If you taste these in the fall or the summer, you probably won't enjoy it very much. They're quite sour at that time and they've got a bit of that kind of cranberry bitterness and muskiness to them. But if you wait until after the fall, after the first frost, then they actually start to sweeten up a bit. They're still rather, fairly tart but much more palatable. And while they taste a lot like the cultivated cranberries and can be used much the same way, they aren't actually even related. They're those cultivated cranberries, they're in the heath family, they're sh small kind of shrubby plants or small vines, maybe up to eight inches tall, in the same genus as blueberries. Uh, whereas these, they're in a totally different family with elderberries and stuff like that. You can kind of get that impression from the shape of the bush. It's also much taller, can be up to even eight feet tall. Here, this, this one's maybe a good ten feet tall here. So, hence the name highbush cranberry. These can be a great source of vitamin C. And as you can imagine, in winter, your sources of vitamin C can be kind of limited. So partially as a result of that, these were enormously popular with the indigenous groups. A lot of them saw them as a very highly prized commodity, early settlers as well, and a lot of people even just up until a few generations back, really. For many of the indigenous groups, they were quite valuable as a trade item. And for some groups, like the, the Haida, for instance, it was kind of seen even as a prestige food, like certain good patches within the community or nearby, high up families would own those and only they would be able to pick them. The kwa kwa they would do sort of a pit cooking thing with it so it almost comes out like a sauce. Or sometimes they would take them fresh and just dip them in animal grease, maybe fish grease or other animal fats. And if that sounds odd to kind of modern western ears, this mixing of fruit and animal fat, that was actually a really widespread practice within indigenous cultures. I mean, in some sense it makes sense because uh, fat can often be used as a preserving agent if you think about like um, preserving pickles in oil or various things like uh, anchovies in oil, sun-dried tomatoes, that, that sort of thing happens in European cooking. Uh, maybe the best known indigenous example outside of indigenous circles would be pemmican where you mix protein with fat, often with dried fruit in there as well. So how do you use these? Well, if you're just walking on the trail or you're in a survival situation, you can definitely just pick them and eat them straight. They're pretty good that way, if a bit tart. But if you want to do something a bit fancier, you can cook them pretty much how you would regular cranberries. They make good jams, jellies, juices. They make a good cranberry sauce. They're pretty versatile in how you can use them. Secondly, have you ever eaten a tree? Some of them are tastier than you might first assume. Now, of course, you can't eat the bulk of a tree. The majority of the tree is just cellulose and lignin, which, while those are sugar compounds, unfortunately humans can't digest them. But that's just the bulk of the tree. If you've ever looked at the cross section of a newly cut down tree, you'll know there's different layers in there. There's the rings, those are the previous year's growth, there's the outer bark, um, but then there's a couple thinner layers in between the two. This is the cambium, which includes a lot of undifferentiated cells. And an undifferentiated cell, that's kind of a fancy way to say it doesn't have a specialized role yet. It could possibly become a leaf cell, or a root cell, or maybe bark, and not that all of these options are necessarily open to all undifferentiated cells, but it hasn't been narrowed down to just one possibility yet. So anyway, that's the area you want to eat. 
Now there's a few ways you could do this, and be aware this isn't great for the tree. If you harvest a big chunk, especially a wide one, you could kill the tree, because it needs these cells in order to carry water and nutrients up from the roots to the top of the tree. So if you're in a survival situation though, and you've, you're already cutting down this tree for timber, or for firewood perhaps, you may as well harvest it anyway. Otherwise, just take small strips. So to do this, you strip off a bit of the outer bark and keep going until you reach the inner bark where it starts to change color. And you'll notice there's just a thin layer before it changes color slightly again, and that's, that's going past what you want to be eating. Now, if you're harvesting this at a different time of year when it's not quite as frozen as it is right here, this would be a lot easier to get off in nice strips, almost like, you know, peeling skin off the tree. But this is a bit too frozen. I, this is the best I'm gonna get right here. So you can chew it kind of like gum. That's not the tastiest way to eat it. Uh, you're better off probably boiling it or maybe frying it, kind of like chips. Or as many used to do in Northern Europe, when grain crops were sparse, you can dry it out kind of pound it and grind it up and mix it in with flour and kind of use that as a flour extender. It's kind of a good way to extend the flour you do have. It doesn't add a lot of nutrients, but it does add bulk and it does make you feel more full, which is a good thing in times of famine. Different trees will have different flavors and that may vary depending when in the year you harvest them too. Some may be sweeter, some may be a little bit more bitter, some may have kind of flavors that are, don't really fit into broad categories necessarily. Uh, a lot of different trees are edible in this respect, but best, if you're going to harvest this, do check up on the species you plan to harvest, because there are a few that are poisonous. Here I'm harvesting the bark from a Siberian elm in my yard, which I don't mind if I actually hurt the tree, because it's very invasive and doesn't belong in Canada anyway. But, and over here I'm harvesting from a blue spruce, which may be dying soon of disease anyway. On the note of ones not to use though, Pacific Yew can be particularly poisonous. Ponderosa Pine, the jury's a bit out on that one. I've heard varying reports. Um, so best just avoid it, to be safe, anyway, until you know better. Uh, Norfolk Pine, Norway Spruce, those ones also avoid those. But a lot of the northern spruces and pines are quite edible. Also a lot of ones like Linden, Elm, Maple, it's quite a long list that can be eaten. A word of warning though, this can be great as a supplement to your diet, but don't try and use it as your main source of food. It's got carbohydrates, and for some trees, a decent amount of vitamin C, but it's not nutritious enough to be your staple food. Having too much in one sitting can be pretty hard to digest. So it's better as a supplement or as a way to extend other resources, or just a good little snack. Thirdly, well, I was going to talk about cattail rhizomes, but the ice is a bit thick right now for harvesting those, so I'll get to that next winter, I suppose. But here's another quick fruit that stays on the bush instead, and that's rose hips. Now if you're into teas that don't use tea leaves, there's a good chance you've used or at least know about these already. And if you don't, when a rose gets pollinated, this is the fruit it makes. Now these might not be quite as good of a food source as highbush cranberries if you can find those, but these also definitely have their place and were used by, again, many indigenous groups throughout North America in the wintertime. The easiest way to eat them? Just nibble on them. They've got a similar tang kind of to a cranberry or maybe, maybe a tart apple as well. But here we get to the big reason they're harder to use than cranberries. The flesh is tasty, but there's not much of it, and underneath you have these big seeds and tiny hairs surrounding them. These hairs are an unpleasant addition to your digestive tract because well, as they go through, they're, they're the reason several groups refer to these as itchy bum berries. But they are a good source of food in winter, so that can be a risk worth taking. So, some uses for it. This is another one of those fruits that can be added dried to pemmican. Some tribes, such as the Inupiat, would take the outer flesh and whip it up with seal oil, maybe other animal fats and water, and make sort of a pudding out of it. Typically sweetened a bit too, because this is fairly tart. Or another northern group, the Tanina, would do a similar thing, sometimes with fats, but also sometimes with fish eggs, so you get a bit of a different texture. I don't know if you still call that a pudding, or what, if there is an English term for that sort of food. There's lots of other uses you can find online that people currently use them for, too. It makes good jams, marmalades, those are pretty common ones. Uh, I've even seen recipes for rosehip ketchup. 
but probably the most familiar use to a lot of people is for tea, and even a lot of commercial tea mixes contain some rose hips. And this is a nice way to use them, because you don't have to worry about those hairs. You can just throw whole rose hips into boiling water and steep it for a bit, maybe mix them with some other ingredients for mixing flavors together. It can be good just to add a little tartness to any other sort of tea. So anyway, another great winter source of vitamin C. So there's a number of other plants you can harvest this time of year, but that's all I have time for today. If you have any suggestions, corrections, especially on my pronunciation of indigenous words, feel free to comment down below. And if you like these videos and would like to see more, liking and subscribing really helps me out. Hi, I just got back from a trip to Papua New Guinea and the Cook Islands recently, and self-isolation from COVID-19 has fortunately given me some time to work on videos about the plants I found there. From plants with their own languages, to plants used to make cheese, mattresses, and bows and arrows, to plants that act as ant houses, the plant kingdom is full of surprises, and the tropics are no exception. So for more weird and wonderful plants, join me next time on Ambling with Sam.